This episode of Crosscut Talks is supported by Alaska Airlines. Hey, welcome to Crosscut Talks. I'm Mark Baumgarten, the managing editor at Crosscut. And today we're talking about race. And this week's guest is more than ready for that conversation. In fact, Ijeoma Aluo has been having that conversation for a while. After all, her breakout book was called So You Want to Talk About Race. That book came out in 2018, a couple years before the murder of George Floyd fueled a nationwide conversation about race, drawing hundreds of thousands of protesters into the streets, eliciting commitments from businesses to do better when it comes to equity, and sending books like hers, including hers, up the bestseller charts. But two years on, where has all that conversation and commitment led us? And where do we go from here? That's the topic of this talk, which took place in early May as part of the Crosscut Festival. In conversation with Seattle Times journalist Naomi Ishisaka, Oluo offers a clear-eyed overview of the state of race in the country right now. Her assessment won't come as a surprise to anyone who's been tracking the faltering efforts to rethink policing in America, the continued inequities in our health care system, or the backlash against teachers who acknowledge the role that white supremacy plays in our history and our culture. But Aluo's strengths are not only in seeing things as they are, but also in seeing what it would take for them to truly change in a meaningful way. This conversation and all other conversations on the social justice track of the 2022 Crosscut Festival is sponsored by Waldron, which would like to share the following message. Waldron helps organizations and people to reach their full potential, guiding human-centered journeys to organizational and professional success with courage, compassion, and discretion. Clients seek out Waldron when their brands are on the line for impactful board consulting, organization and leadership development, executive coaching, career transition, and career management. Waldron is proud to support CrossCut, a forum for truth and dialogue that increases knowledge, understanding, and compassionate participation. I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you have any feedback, please send it to talks at crosscut.com. Okay, on with the show. Ajama, welcome and thank you for joining me today. Hi, Naomi. It's a pleasure to be talking with you again. You too. So um, let's just get into it. So back in the summer of 2020, We saw a global racial justice movement sparked by the murder of George Floyd. The New York Times estimated it was the largest protest movement in US history. But now two years later, things have in large part reverted to the status quo. And I'm just wondering why you think that might be. Well, I think because the truth is, is that protest itself doesn't change things. Protest can draw attention to what needs to change. It can create opportunities for people who are fighting for change. But if you if you don't have the follow up, if the will isn't there, then it won't happen. And sometimes also protest is incremental. Sometimes it's not this protest, but the next protest that brings us a little closer. But I would say that you know, a lot of what we saw in the uprisings of 2020 was a lot of outrage, um, rightfully so, but also a lot of people trying to figure out what they could do to feel better as quickly as possible. And so getting out, yelling, screaming, that can make you feel better if you are not the target of the systemic racism that will continue on after people feel better. And so a lot of people gave statements, a lot of companies gave their you know, platitudes, they, you know, verbally affirm their commitment towards anti-racism, but structurally it was limited to what would make the majority feel better at the time. And so where we saw systemic change enacted, where we saw things like perhaps youth jail projects being canceled, we saw lasting change, right? Um, where we saw cops being removed from schools, we saw lasting change. 
where we saw these things that we could get in writing that actually changed the way our systems work. We, we, we saw change that we can build off of. But where we saw diversity mission statements, vague promises to do better, people kneeling together for photo ops, none of that is actual change. And a lot of that w w sufficed for people who don't have skin in the game. And so that's why we are where we are. A lot of people asked me in 2020, you know, what's different about this? And even as we were in the middle of these uprisings, I remember saying, you can't tell what's different about this now. You can ask me five years from now, what's different about this? We'll only know based on what we do with this moment. Yes, there was an unprecedented amount of outrage and an increase in awareness, but an awareness only provides you the opportunity to better act should you choose to act. And a lot of people chose not to act. Right, and we also saw that some of those more systemic changes, things like policing reforms or changes to, you know, how we prosecute um, low level misdemeanors and things like that have kind of flipped back the other direction, you know? So even the things that did have some teeth, you know, they were few and far between, but even those, you know, at, like you said, like they still kind of reverted back to the water level, which is, you know, the status quo. And some went even further in reverse. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's important to recognize, like once people, once people who weren't going to be, you know, long-term activists around this, people who just wanted to feel better in the moment stopped looking then those who were actually really frightened by what we were able to accomplish were like, quick, let's get what we can right now. And let's capitalize off of the fear that everyone else who's invested in this sort of violent white supremacy has right now to push even further. And that backlash is a common cycle. We see it all the time. And it doesn't mean we don't keep pushing. It means we have to be aware of that and we have to fight back as hard and we need to stop relaxing the moment we're given a little bit because even the little bit we got wasn't enough, certainly wasn't enough to relax, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's what a lot of people did. You know, the activists that were fighting before 2020 are still fighting now, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the people that were supporting them and giving, helping, giving them the attention, the funds, all of, you know, that they needed to push for these things they've been asking for for years and decades, disappeared. And then while they were gone, you know, power reverted to where it's always been and order was restored, you know, um, shall we say. And a lot of people decided they were going to try to make sure that something like this couldn't happen again. And it's no surprise that this is at the same time we're seeing the, you know, anti-critical race theory uh, movements up coming as well, because a lot of people said, oh, I want to make sure that my kids don't actually understand how this works next time there's protests. I don't want to see my son out there. I don't want to see my, my kid out there. I don't want to have arguments with my family about what I'm supporting or not. So I would really rather they don't understand how this ties into the history of this country. And I was also asking about, which is this, this focused, you know, some would say obsession, critical theory. Do you think that it's, it's a strategic sort of keep your eye on something else so you can't focus on the thing that you were focused on before? Or do you think it's more kind of a backlash or, or a fear um, response like you were saying? Like, do you think that it's sort of a, a way to kind of distract people from the things that people were afraid were going to change? Um, I would say it's kind of a combination of things. So I would say it is political opportunism that is capitalizing off of real fear, right? Mm -hmm. So it's real fear. And the truth is, is if you are a white supremacist family who sends your kids off to college, you have reason to fear what they're learning in school, because what they're learning can directly challenge what you've taught them, the harm that you've taught them to participate in. That has always been true. And that's why higher education has always been a target of those who wish to continue to have exploitative, oppressive systems, and those who wish to continue to uh, profit off of division and fear. So that's always been true. Um, is critical race theory the actual thing? No, 
No, of course not. But you can call it anything, right? The people out there showing up at elementary schools saying, stop teaching my kid critical race theory, have no idea what critical race theory is. Mm -hmm. um, but the fear is real. And, and the thing about that vagueness is you can put anything in it. You could put anything in it and say, this is the fight. So the people leading this are opportunists, right? The people leading this probably have no emotional connection to what's being taught or what isn't being taught. But they do know that they can fire up a lot of terrified parents and, you know, then get political power. And that is real. That fear that they have is real. But the political operatives who are designing this, um, for them, it's about their power. And so we have two levels of this going on where, you know, the people who are saying you should fear critical race theory absolutely know what critical race theory is and absolutely know that, you know, it's not something being taught in their kids' elementary schools and that, you know, it's it's not even why their kids are, you know, coming home from college challenging their ideas, but what they do know is it shores up their political base to have a strong join with me to fight this and to give people something they feel like they can do in a world that terrifies them because it's a world that's changing in ways that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the opacity around CRT is kind of what gives that more power, right? Because if you don't really know what it is and if you don't really understand it, it can be the biggest boogeyman you could possibly mm -hmm. imagine because you don't really understand what it is, right? You don't really, right. it doesn't really make sense to you. It does, but I would also say these efforts to try to educate people on what it is aren't gonna help either because mm -hmm. it's not as if what's actually being taught is less is is less scary. Like, no, we are teaching about systemic racism. It's not actually critical race theory, <laughs> like, you know, but people are like, well, I don't want that either. You know, like I don't want whatever this is. Yes, the, the vagueness of it is, is allows people to not have to have deep conversations about what they're doing and why and and how they're participating honestly and in, in, you know advocating for mass censorship um but they also don't want to know they know enough they know that it's centering populations of color they know it's probably vaguely tied to trans people having rights and to, you know, all these other things that, that scare them. And that's all they want to know. They want that ignorance so that they can continue to be angry without having to dig any deeper and without having to implicate themselves um, in their own biases and their own prejudices. And, you know, this is a media related um, event, and I'm just wondering how your thoughts on how the media has contributed to when this sort of pendulum swing back and forth, but then also, you know, this conversation around CRT. Yeah, um, I think that if, if we ever get a real fair accounting as to what's happened these last few years, socially and politically, media is going to be held responsible for a lot of this. Media legitimizes. And one of the main problems with having the majority of quote unquote mainstream media run by white men is that you are able to find everything fascinating. You are able to find the debate about people's lives fascinating and therefore you think it's newsworthy and that legitimizes things that shouldn't be legitimized it is too late in the day to be debating the humanity of people of color the humanity of disabled people the humanity of trans people and yet because it fascinates white cis men. They'll say, but let's talk about it. And what that does then is it says, oh, well, it's not settled. There's still space for this debate, this debate that's killing people, this debate that's justifying um, removing people's rights and safeties. And media plays a part in it because so many people making decisions never have to think, what impact will this piece have on my life? Mm -hmm. And we legitimized violent white supremacy 
during the Trump election. We've legitimized trans misogyny during these debates over trans people being able to use restrooms, to play sports, right? We've legitimized all of these things by saying, but let's keep talking about it. There are things we don't, you know, there's a reason why we don't have articles saying, you know, um, murdering your boss, is it okay, right? Because we know it's not. And to have the people like, that's absurd. Why would you have that debate? That's absurd, right? Well, you know, I, I argue it's absurd to say, should, you know, should we do something about black people getting murdered by cops? Like, that's absurd. And yet we keep doing it and legitimizing it and allows people to stay in places of bigotry. It allows systems to say, you know what, we'll wait and see how this shakes out before we do anything. Um, and they played a part in that because they were fascinated because they had nothing to lose and they really valued their own entertainment over the safety of the people impacted by what they were quote unquote debating. And, and I think that there's something to be, you know, I hope that we can learn from that. I don't see any indication we are, but when we look at the people who, you know, who would have known who Milo was if it weren't for all of the fascinated people on the left who were like, let's find out, you know, right? Like who would have known who a lot of these people were? Who would have, you know, who would have taken any of these things seriously if it weren't people going, oh, you know, let me go behind the scenes. This is so, I'm so curious, you know? And it doesn't mean that we don't need to be aware of threats. There are real threats out there, but it's not what we're being made aware of. You know, we are being fascinated by the personalities and the motivations behind these real threats instead of saying, this is the threat Here's the people who will be impacted by this threat. Let's talk about them and their lives and what needs to happen to address this and not let's 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 investigate the motivations behind this threat and the fascinations. And is it really a threat? You know, like we need to be more clear and media, when it's run by people with a lot of privilege, they don't see the urgency and they only see it when it comes to them when it's too late. And then they're like, how did this happen? And they played such a huge part. Right. I mean, and it's almost like a, an intellectual exercise you're describing versus an actual, um, so, uh, an actual approach that resonates with the humanity of the people that are being discussed, right? Or connects with the humanity Absolutely. of the people being discussed. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if you, if you have any thoughts or examples of, of positive efforts that you think um, you've seen to shift systems that uphold white supremacy, like things that are actually making a difference, actually actually working. Yeah, I would say, you know, it's important to recognize that the things that are going to motivate us that we need to build off of are always going to be small. <laughs> They're always going to be local, but it absolutely matters. When we see organizations first and foremost talking with their money, and I'm not talking about here's a donation, I'm saying, if this matters to us as much as everything else we say matters to us, we will spend accordingly. Our resources will be spent accordingly. Our time, all of this, right? We will reward accordingly. So when you see organizations that say, we're going to become a more anti-racist organization, and the first thing they start looking at is saying, what percentage of our budget goes to this? Whose full-time job is this? How do we reward this? How do we find ways to support this in every department we have? Like that's the sort of progress we see in smaller spaces. When we see schools saying we have a problem with racism, let's start with a, an audit, a deep dive. Let's put the hours behind it. Let's put the resources behind it. Let's empower the people that we're bringing in to make change, to actually make it. Let's reward people who wanna be a part of this. Let's make clear cut examples of where, you know, of what will happen if you decide not to be a part of this, right? Um, that can really help. And so I've definitely seen, you know, I've been in different spaces, you know, for years now. Um, I've seen schools that have really decided we're gonna change 
everything. We're going to actually look at all of our rules that we have in our rule books and say, how does this look from a racial equity standpoint? We're going to look at our hiring, our retention, our recruitment, and say, what does this look like from a racial equity standpoint? We're going to get every police officer out of these schools. We're going to look at who's getting suspended and who's not, right? Like those sorts of things absolutely matter. When it comes to things like policing, you know, very few things. I mean, there are, there's important things, right? Like, like getting, you know, appointment for King County Sheriff, right? Like that matters. That matters a lot. That sort of accountability matters, right? Um, but nothing major that I could point to in that arena. You know, there are different spaces, you know, of course. Um, and looking at like KEXP's very public steps towards eight race equity, they're still in the very beginning of that, but those are real things where you can see actual shifts in budget and policy and procedure that matter. They still, you know, every all these places have a long ways to go. But the truth is, is like, I want people to think small. I don't want people to think there is something that the White House could pass today that's gonna do this. And instead think there's something my church could do today. There's something my school or my kid's classroom could do today. There's something I could do today in the office. Because the truth is, is that all of these systems are what impact our lives the most. If you're a Black person and your race is one of the most definitive factors of your health, wealth, and well-being in this country, it is because when you walk into your office, you are viewed as a Black person and you're interacting with a system that is hostile towards you, right? Because when you go into your doctor's office, you're interacting with a system that is hostile towards you. When you go grocery shopping, you're interacting with a system that's hostile towards you. All of these things are the things that actually kill us day in and day out. Like, yes, it will make news when police officers kill us. It doesn't make news when we go to the doctor complaining of chest pains and we're told that we're pill seeking. It doesn't make news when our blood pressure is high because we're constantly being told that our attitude needs to be checked at work. It doesn't make news when our kids are suspended and expelled from school, right? But that's what actually kills us. That's what we fear. And that is where people have the power to make the most change. And so I want people to f first figure out what's happening, where they are, what is happening in your office? What is happening in your kid's school? What is happening in your church group? You know, what is happening in your city? Pick an area, figure out what's happening. Listen to the people of color in those spaces when saying what change they need and figure out how can I help this? How can I amplify this? How can I be of use? And that will be so, that matters so much more than who you vote for. It matters so much more than what you share on social media. You know, it, that's where the work really is. That's such a, that's such a great point. And, um, and it segues well into my, my next question is, you know, we talked about, when we talked about your book in, in 2020, um, you, you said that often in, in progressive spaces like Seattle, um, white people don't, own their whiteness and their culpability in racist systems. Like, like to focus on, you know, what the Trump administration's doing or what, you know, those racist people in the South are doing, but not those day-to-day -day systems that they benefit from, but don't necessarily want to say, okay, well, maybe I should make a different, different choice when I am, you know, seeing a patient or, you know, being a lawyer, whatever it is that they do. Um, and so I'm curious what you think um, white people particularly could do more of to to kind of look at themselves in, in that in that way, like how would they might be, you know, kind of absolving themselves of participation. Yeah, that's a, that's a great um, that's a really great question. There's um, a really really good book called White Identity Politics by Ashley Jardina, and she's a sociologist, and she really looked at like what activates white identity. What does that look like? And what she found, which is what a lot of, you know, I'd say people of color in this country know, which is that oftentimes white people don't think consciously about whiteness and their own whiteness. It is, it is a reactionary identity. It is something that you're aware of only when it seems to be under threat because this is a white supremacist country. White people are able to think of American as a stand in for white. And so when something happens to challenge the way they see America or their connection to it, suddenly they're white. And so the great awakening of reactionary violent white identity that we saw with the election of President Obama 
that has carried through and really directly led to what we've been seeing these last few years is really people going, America doesn't look like me now. So now I'm white and I'm under threat. And that is dangerous. An identity that you don't name for yourself, that you don't take responsibility for, that you allow others to name for you is a dangerous identity. And it is vital that white people recognize that whether they want to believe it or not, they are part of a political social group. They are part of a power structure. They are making collective decisions that impact not only people of color in this country, but the entire world. And they are responsible for what it does. And just because they don't want to pay attention to it when it serves them doesn't mean they aren't responsible. And so I want white people to understand that just as I am black, you're white. And that means something. And I want you to look at what it is. And if it seems hard to look at, if you don't want to look at the Charlottesville riots and say, that's me, then you need to look at it and say, how do I change that? And own that and start normalizing it. The amount of times I'm in conversations and people will say, as a black woman, how do you feel this? And they won't then relate and say, oh, as a white person, I feel this because they don't think about that. They think, oh, as an individual, I feel this. They don't think the way I think, the way I see the world, the way I move through the world has been conditioned by whiteness. And to recognize that, own it. And if you don't like it and you don't want to own it, change it and have conversations. Recognize that if you have kids, you are teaching kids how to be white right now. You know, if you are in social groups with, with majority white people, you are setting examples of how to be white right now. So be conscious of that and start looking at it and saying, okay, politically, if this is what we've done, if historically, this is what we've done, this is our history, just like everything we want to be proud of is our history. What do we do to change it? What do we do to make things right? And, and do that because it's who you are, because you don't want to have to hide from your history. If you can acknowledge the real uncomfortable truths of white supremacy and see that in your history and see where you've benefited from it and know that you are doing something to change it. It doesn't hurt you anymore to look at it. It doesn't shame you to look at it. It only shames you when you don't want to do something about it, when you want to continue to benefit from it. There's a part of you that says this is wrong. And that's what you hide from. If you don't want to hide anymore, if you want to have real genuine relationships first with yourself and then with the rest of the world, stop hiding from it. Own it and say, now, how do I move in the direction of who I want to be? And how do I bring my peers, these people I love, my family, my community with me to make this something I can really be proud of? And then you can be proud of that journey. You don't have to be perfect. You can still be proud of the journey. None of us are perfect. Um, but you have to be willing to face that. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of the antithesis of this, I think, um, instinct to sort of say, well, I'm just going to move to Canada or I'm just going to, you know, pull out of this whole this whole conversation because I, I hate it here or whatever. Right. Like we're part of this system. We're responsible for it. And white supremacy exists in Canada. You know, like it's not like <laughs> there's no place in the world that hasn't been touched by this and right. uh, that, that isn't participating in this. So, you know, we have our own unique part of it here. But, you know, giving up one for the other, especially when you when you've been granted the privilege to because of your skin tone. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of black people who would really love to be somewhere else right now, you know, um, but they can't. Passports are expensive. Moving is expensive. Um, a lot of places don't see you as, you know, a valuable person to be brought into another country. We would love to be somewhere else right now. So, you know, to be like, oh, I'm going to use the privilege of white supremacy to move and ignore what I'm a part of here. And I'll be a part of this different flavor of white supremacy is like the epitome of privilege. Switching gears just a little bit. Um, as we are talking right now, there's rallies happening across the country. Um, to protect access to abortion after the, the leak last night. Um, and abortion is often not seen as a racial justice issue. And 
wondered if you could just talk a little bit about who is most impacted by restriction, restricting abortion rates and who is often left out of the conversation. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I was talking about this last night too. This is of course, you know, devastating. I don't, it's not surprising. I think a lot of us have been preparing for years for this moment that we knew was coming. Um, but I've been really clear in the, in the years that I've been talking about reproductive justice, that first and foremost, reproductive justice does not begin and end with abortion. And that there are populations in this country who have never had reproductive freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, black women have never had reproductive freedom. Disabled people have never had reproductive freedom. You know, um, Native people have never had reproductive freedom. Trans and non-binary people have never had reproductive freedom. Incarcerated people have never had reproductive freedom. Reproductive freedom is not just, I, I reserve the right to terminate a pregnancy. It's an important part of it. But it's also, I reserve the right to not get pregnant. And that means having a doctor who listens to me when I say that this birth control isn't working to me or giving me, providing birth control I could afford, right? Or it means I have the right to have affirmative consent in my sexual relations. I have the right, even if I am incarcerated to make a decision over my body, I have the right to become pregnant should I choose to, even if I'm disabled. I have the right to medical care. I have the right to watch my children grow. All of that is reproductive freedom. And that has never been fully granted to so many people. But if you have privilege, you view it at your right to make this choice that you came to fully because you had these other privileges. Now, that being said, having been denied all these other avenues of reproductive choice, the right to an abortion is often all that many people of color, poor people, disabled people, trans and non-binary people have. And to lose that, it's gutting. And it is so disproportionately going to impact our communities. Those of us who cannot travel, those of us who don't have the resources, those of us who don't have that power and protection and support, those of us who are less likely to have choices to stop us from even having to make an abortion choice, right? That they will be most impacted. And I want people to understand that because in 2016, I remember speaking at a Planned Parenthood event and saying, so many people in the audience right now are crying for a future that has already happened to us. And I'd say that's where we are still. And so I want people to look at that and say, what can we do to broaden reproductive justice and freedom? That will all help right now. What can we do to invest in the ways in which marginalized populations have continued to work to get access to reproductive care, right? That has existed and will continue to exist. What can we do to try to increase and ensure our rights? And what can we do that can't be taken away? Because I really do want people to understand there is not there is no way our freedom is ever going to really be granted to us in a white supremacist capitalist misogynist system, right? It needs power and control. We can, we can momentarily have some semblance of choice and protection and it will be taken from us anytime we are a threat, anytime our freedom becomes a threat and that's what we're seeing right now. And so we have to look at what is permanent to me? What does it mean to permanently secure reproductive freedoms? What would we need to build around and outside of our systems in order to get that? And that's what I really want people to start looking at. We'll be back with more after this message. Dreaming of a long-awaited vacation? Take your travels to the next level with Alaska Airlines. They're committed to providing a higher standard of safety and cleanliness throughout your journey. From mask requirements and touch-free options to HEPA filters on board and fresh air every two to three minutes. Plus, their award-winning loyalty program, Mileage Plan, makes it easy to earn and redeem miles wherever you go, including destinations worldwide, thanks to their One World Alliance membership. If you're ready to land a low fare, next-level care, and the best experience in the air, book now 
at alaskaair.com. So um, I think I think we should probably move to the audience questions. There are some really great ones here, and I don't want to run out of time. Um, the first one is, what do you feel needs to be done in the workplace to avoid window dressing and the check boxes and move towards a, an inclusive culture? Um, a lot, but I would say there's a little thought exercise I like to do with cor- corporations when I'm giving a talk is I always like to say, imagine you were 20, 30% behind on your revenue and you're having a meeting and you tell your boss, oh, well, you know, we're 20 to 30% behind. The boss goes, how behind? I don't know. Something around that. Could I get a better number? Well, it feels 20 to 30%. What do you plan on doing it? Well, James likes money. So in his spare time, perhaps he can take a look at it and we'll maybe have a meeting. What are we going to do in a meeting? We're going to talk about how we feel about being behind on our budget. Okay, then what? Well, you know, then maybe we'll put a statement saying our budget's important to us. All right. Well, what? how, how will we know if the budget's fixed? Well, if it feels like we have more money, I'm sure it'll be fixed. Okay. Well, what happens if we don't feel like we have more money? Well, then we'll, you know, have another meeting and we'll talk about how we feel about it, right? That's how we talk about racial equity. That's how businesses deal with racial equity. Mm -hmm. And they'll put that line that racial equity matters right alongside of meeting their financial goals, right alongside all these other things as if it's just as important. And yet the way that we treat racial equity would get you laughed out of any office if you tried it with anything else that actually matters to a business. So what I always tell them is treat it like your money. Treat it like you're going to go out of business if you don't have racial equity in your space. What would you do? You would have a team. You would hire specialists. You would make it a goal. You would reward progress. You would measure progress, right? You would have consequences for failing to meet those goals. You would change the environment and make sure that you have people in the environment who are oriented towards that goal. You would celebrate it. You would know exactly where you stand on it, right? That's what you would do if it matters. And so I always want people to think about it, go, you know what, you say it matters. Have you treated, are you treating it like your money? Are you treating it like you can't survive without it? Because you actually can't. You think you can, but you're buying time. You really can't. So you might as well start treating it like your money now. That's a great, that's a great exercise. I love that. Um, So um, speaking of going back to what you were saying earlier about small things that impact our everyday systems, What is one thing um, you think would help in the public education arena? Oh, man. So when it comes to public education, I'm assuming we're talking about like K through 12, or that's where I'm going to put it, Mm -hmm. um, because they're very different spaces. Um, There's a couple of small things I think that would really matter. One, schools really need to start looking at parent involvement when they lack it as a failure on their part. There are a lot of racial equity issues around parent and guardian involvement. Um, PTA meetings that meet at 3 p.m. on a Wednesday are, is an equity issue to parents who have to work, right? Um, parent-teacher conferences that don't think about things like child care, notices that don't go out in multiple languages, those are all things that actually cut families off. And you also need to think about how families can connect Connecting families of color is one of the most powerful things a school can do in order to increase equity. Because right now, children and parents of color are being gaslit by schools. Kids are being targeted and told they're the problem, or they're being told it's not happening at all. And they need to be in rooms with other parents to talk about what's happening, what needs to be improved on, what's happening that's great, so that they can actually find patterns, get support, and move things forward. A lot of teachers say, I would love to be a part of this, but I don't have the support. Well, have you thought of getting all of the parents of color in the room together? Have you thought about talking about what's actually happening so that parents can realize, I don't, I don't have a bad kid. I have a targeted kid mm-hmm. and you have a targeted kid. And maybe we need to go in together and work on this. So building that, schools should build those spaces. They should build those spaces. They should have families of color nights where families can come together. And I've seen them, they're great when they happen. You know, they should be talking about, can everyone read these notices? If I'm not hearing from a parent, what am I doing that's failing that, 
what are we doing as an institution that's making people feel like they can't communicate with us? And, and really increasing that sort of involvement that can make such a huge, huge difference in empowering you know, minority populations within schools who have been told that often the best way to success for their kids is to be quiet and, and, and the opposite is true. And so what you can do to support that is, is probably one of the most important things you can do. And then also just get, get cops out of schools, get cops out of schools, no cops in schools. Oh my goodness. Like there is nothing more devastating to black and indigenous students than cops in schools, get them out. There is no reason to have cops in schools. All it does is increase incarceration. It doesn't make kids safer. It just increases incarceration. It just tells Black students and Indigenous students in particular, and also you know Hispanic students, that school isn't for them, that they are to be controlled. Get them out of schools. There should be zero tolerance for that in schools. Thank you. Uh, this next question comes from a viewer named Tony. Um, she says, as a 72-year-old Black woman who was very active in the civil rights period, what I find depressingly lacking now is the old expression about keeping your eyes on the prize. Rather than castigate the same old media villains and corporate white bad guys, how do you focus others on, quote, the prize, rather than watch them splinter into every individual atrocity that makes the daily blogosphere? You know, that's, that's a good question. And I would say it's difficult. The truth is, is that we live in a world where shock is rewarded, where trauma, activating trauma in people is rewarded, where we are constantly told that there's nothing we can do systemically, but you can do something individually. And so it is a distraction to serve us individuals to hate, individuals to fight. Oh, well, you know what? You, maybe we can't get police reform, but this woman who called the cops on someone at you know, a barbecue we can make sure she pays. That doesn't actually make us safe. And it doesn't mean that there's no consequences for that person. I firmly believe in consequences, right? If someone's life has been in danger, there should be consequences. But that in itself is a systemic issue, right? The question should be, why do people feel like they can act with impunity? What does that say about our laws? What does that say about our system? What does that say about our social circles, right? Um, but it's hard to do when we're constantly being served up these new outrages. We're human beings and that emotional reaction is natural. And the truth is, is that before social media, we just, there was no way to serve it to us enough to keep us that high, you know, highly distracted. So I think what's important is to remember that where we're being served this traumatizing content, they're profiting off of it distance ourselves from the places that are profiting off of our trauma and our pain and look for the places that start recognizing patterns that start trying to talk about systemic solutions and reward that and say, right now I'm glued to this because when you are being traumatized, when you're targeted, you have, you feel like you have to be hyper vigilant, right? And that's what we're doing. And I don't want to fault people who are stuck in this. This is a trauma response. When you are being targeted, you become hypervigilant. You start looking for what's happening because you don't want to be caught by surprise. And then we are being served more of it to, that increases our trauma, that makes us more hypervigilant. So I don't want to demonize that. I don't want to shame that. I want us to try to recognize that that is being done to us and the people doing it to us are being rewarded with profits. And so how do we distance ourselves from that? And so really start looking and saying, it's actually not journalism to do this to us. If I read this and all I feel is outrage and I don't understand why, and I don't, I don't understand where in the system to make change, I, it is not journalism. I am being exploited for my pain. And that's what I want people to understand. Um, you know, it's already hard enough as a minority population to try to focus on all the things we need to focus on. And getting that and recognizing that and breaking away from this incredibly powerful machine that is determined to keep us feeling like we have to get every new story or will be next um, is hard, but I think we need to talk about it more. 
And we need to really start looking and providing examples of where, you know, this is good, this helps, this gives me a direction. This doesn't give me an individual's cell phone number or address or a name to Google incessantly. This tells me that this law has encouraged this action or, you know, this system here is protecting these actions. And this is where I need to take the fight. And, and that's really where we need to look at what we reward and, and try to break away. And it's really hard to do. We're not going to be perfect at it, but it's worth the effort. Well said. Um, thank you. We've unfortunately run out of time and I had to leave some questions on the table. I'm sorry about that, but um, I wish we could keep talking. Um, I could listen to Joma talk all day. Um, and, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. So much You've given us so much to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. And your questions were amazing. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks again to Ijeoma and Naomi for the talk. And thanks also to the folks in the audience who asked questions. If you'd like to be one of those audience members for a future CrossCut event, go to crosscut.com slash events. This episode of CrossCut Talks was produced by Sarah Bernard and engineered by Resty Bacall and Victoria Ralph. The event was produced by Jake Newman and Andrea O'Meara. Anne Krisnovich managed our audience engagement. You can subscribe to CrossCut Talks wherever you listen. And if you like the show, please review us. It helps other people find us. For the latest political, environmental, and culture news from the Pacific Northwest, visit CrossCut.com. And if you would like to support the work that we do at CrossCut, whether it's the live events we host every month or the in-depth reporting we deliver every day, go to crosscut.com membership. In addition to supporting our journalism, members receive complete access to the on-demand programming of Seattle's PBS station, KCTS9. CrossCut Talks is a product of Cascade Public Media. I'm Mark Bumgarten. We'll be back soon with another conversation.